This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blayton. I'm Sam Merciers. And this morning we are joined by composer and new music box writer and editor Alex Gardner. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Hi guys, thanks for having me. So, Alex, uh, we uh, let's let's start off. We've got a couple of really interesting things to talk to you about this morning. Um, let's start off with the way probably most of our audience is, is familiar with you because we talk about the things that you do on the internet all the time. Um, and you are, what is your title at New Music Box? Are you an associate editor? Yeah, associate editor. Um, so uh, how long have, have you been involved with New Music Box? Uh, about almost two and a half years. Okay. Um, and you you write about how often for them? About once a week or so? Yeah, once a week. Um, CD essays about CDs, a blog post here and there, an interview with another composer. Depends, yeah. So one thing that I would uh, imagine, and I was I was just thinking about this this morning, is that um, you know you're you're a composer, but probably the the thing that is the most visible to the most people that you do is the things that you do on new music box and i'm wondering if that right. if it's ever frustrating to you when when you come on you like you come on the show or you meet somebody new and they know you first for not your music um yeah i don't really i don't really find it frustrating i mean i get to you know be around music all day long and talk to other composers and uh you know, a lot of people already know that I'm that I'm a composer and um, in the community that that we talk to a lot. So yeah, I don't I don't generally find it frustrating. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's not yeah. It's a it is a different role okay. that I play. You know, during the day, it's true. But I I you know frame it in a in a way that that is not competitive or frustrating or anything. Right. We're we're all about supporting composers. Sure. So, so yeah. So, that, and I go ahead. I, I try to look at it like, you know, I'm a composer. I get what people do. You know, Frank and I are both the, you know, the composer um, members of the new music box staff. So, we really try to, you know, reach out to all kinds of different composers doing different things and, and uh, give everybody some love. Well, that's very cool. Um, so, when that's one of the things that I really appreciate about New Music Box, as opposed to um, other sources for similar information, is that it is written by composers, um, and so I feel like a, a lot of times uh, it addresses certain things about the new music world that I that I don't get in other places. Is that your experience writing there? Yeah, I mean we come at it from a, you know, from, from the viewpoint of other composers and also Molly Sheridan, who is the, who is, um, our fearless leader is a really wonderful music journalist. And she's been working on new music box for like 13 years, I think now. So yeah, she gets it. She gets composers possibly even better than Frank and I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah, we tried to, um, come at it from a different viewpoint than, than, uh, than other, you know, magazines and blogs and such. And, and I just, I have, I have one more question when we need, I don't yeah. want to talk the whole time about new music box, but, um, how has being on new music box affected your career as a composer? Has that, has there been any kind of intersection between those two things? Um, I think really, I don't feel like it's changed anything radically, except for the fact that I write, uh, you know, on an almost weekly basis. So I guess people, you know, see that and, and read it. And I've gotten to meet a lot of really cool people and, you know, interview other composers, which is always so interesting. So, um, in terms of, you know, I've got to meet a lot of people and, um, and, you know, sort of be out in the world in a way that that is unusual 
for a composer, but I, I'm not sure that it's really, you know, it hasn't completely changed my life in a, in a huge way as a composer. All right. Well, that's good. That's, that's good to know. I, I think we've all had kind of a similar experience doing Sound Notion is that it's, it's fun and we've gotten to meet a lot of cool people, but exactly. it hasn't had a dramatic impact on, you know, our, our music in any way. Sam, you're right. running. Well, except that you can't go <clears throat> to disc golf tournaments because they happen on Sunday. <laughs> Which, that's ruined. right there's there's sacrifices that have to be made <laughs> alex so, his, his... if you knew how much i was into disc golf you'd be honored no seriously <laughs> though, uh, seriously though uh and and we can all you know uh they can all attest to this we've said many times man we need to have alexander gardner on the show because we'll do one of your pieces and we'll talk and we're like we need to get her on the show and it was just something that took way too long to happen and we're very glad you're here Oh, thank you. So when, go ahead, Sam. Tell the truth, aren't I, Dave? Absolutely. Yeah. We 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 have a list of like people that we really should have asked to be on the show many many times before, uh, and and you're certainly one of them. And it's good that you're on when you're on because you have a really cool performance coming up, a new new piece uh, with the Seattle Symphony. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that piece and and how that came about. And for the record, I'm a huge Yes fan. Yeah, me too. Are you? Oh, okay, good. Well, cool. I used to be. I'm a, you know, uh, a former You're huge Yes fan. A grown-up you know? now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, the piece that, the, the piece is, um, it's a work for the Seattle Symphony, and it's happening at the end of the month on October 26th, and it's part of a new program that they have called Sonic Evolution, um, which is very cool. This is the second year that they're doing it. Um, and it's designed to sort of bring the orchestra together and with some of the um, rock and pop presences from Seattle, of which there are many, um, and sort of honor, honor some different musical traditions of Seattle. So they're com commissioning composers to... Um, write pieces that, that reflect upon um, the music of certain groups. For instance, last year, um, William Brattell did a piece that was based on the music of Kurt Cobain. And there was a Jimi Hendrix piece as well. Um, and they do, they pick three composers to commission. So, so each year the concert has three world premieres, which is crazy and awesome. And uh, yeah. this year, uh, they paired me with um, with the drummer of the band Yes, Alan White, who has lived in Seattle for many, many years. So um, my job was to sort of think about the music of Yes and have and work him into the piece. Um, and he'll be playing with the orchestra. It's not a concerto, but he has like a significant presence cool. in the work. Okay. So. I'm extremely jealous, and I bet Nate, Nate feels the same way. Um, I hadn't listened to any Yes in quite a while, so this morning I got up and I strapped on some Heart of the Sunrise. Nate, are you familiar? Yeah. <laughs> so to me, that's if there's anyone out there who hasn't like really gotten into Yes, if that that's like the whole package. You get everything they're about. You know, like very lyrical, but also lots of different movements and sort of like a rondo <laughs> form. <laughs> Tight sort of, you know, lopsided metrically lines and stuff. All of it's in there. It's really great, great. And if you want to hear how groovy this drum set player can be, like doing these, you know, just playing along and then doing like two bars of a polyrhythmic groove that rides along with it and then changing back and the whole band mm -hmm. around like that so well. Mm -hmm. I'm really jealous that you got to write for this guy. It's uh yeah, it's been really it's been really really fun. I I actually he is he has um sort of a in a role in the orchestra that has quite a bit of improvisation because my, my thought was like, well, how am I going to write something for this guy who's been drumming for 40 years with yes, that's going to be, you know, even comparable to what he would do on his own. So we've worked together to make like some structural decisions and basic rhythmic you know, um, choices. And there's times when he just going to wing it. 
So that's going to be really, <laughs> that's going to be really fun. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience working with him, because it seems like you would be coming from, you're, you're coming from such different traditions yeah. um, where you, you know, the, the conservatory background and writing dots and lines and him coming from a band situation where it's a group of people all kind of working together and it's not, I assume none of it's written down. Is it, it yep. so what is what is this like? Um, it was really it was a lot easier than I thought, actually. I was expecting it to be, you know, a much well, more good, difficult. It sounds terrifying. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. When the project first came up, I was like, that sounds absolutely terrifying. Yes, I'll do it, of course. You know? Of course, <laughs> so, yeah. Right. That's so, the right um, answer. Um yeah, it was actually surprisingly easy. I mean, he doesn't really he can read music, but he doesn't, and the way the band works has nothing to do with reading music everything is done by ear and his ear is you know fantastic so right. i mean the way we work together is i would bring him material to listen to and then he, together we would sort of figure out what made sense for him to do working with it and if he had ideas for you know hearing things that might go along with what i already had and you know he helped me sort of yesify Yesify the piece, you know, yeah. since he really understands what it means to give some music a, a yes treatment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what were some of those things? I'm curious. Like, what, what, what did you uh, not have in the piece that he that he thought, or, or what, what did he want to change about the piece to make it more yes like? Well, he didn't really change anything. I mean, just his presence. The way he drums is really a big part of the group of the of the sound of the band so um just having him in it kind of automatically adds a a thing a yes thing to it but also um like the way the bass and the drums interact in the band is is um they have a specific way that they do things and it's not something that you can really articulate you just sort of hear it it's a thread that sort of weaves its way through all their you know albums so um we worked on that and um i mean i noticed that and he was like oh yeah you're right that's we could do something like this and this and this um and he just gave a lot of really general ideas that allowed me to flesh out the piece in a way that would sort of meet the goal of the assignment to make it sound a little bit like it could be material from this band that's so, cool yeah, it's very did you did you take any actual material from their stuff? Did you quote nope. anything? Nothing. Nope. Oh wow! So you're you're creating from whole cloth this this thing that is so, sounds so much a part of. That's very cool. Um, Drum set is not mic'd or amplified or anything. It's just in the ensemble. It's just going to be in the ensemble. It will be just... plenty loud enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that'll be a difference already in the performance, though. Like, I'm sure yeah. he's, yeah, used to performing with a, the whole kit. and the, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that Sonic Evolution is not, this is not the first year for this project with the Seattle Symphony. Um, but the, the two artists you mentioned that they, they uh, featured, um, or I guess the two the two Seattle people that they that they incorporated into the last season that you mentioned were Jimi Hendrix and Kurt Cobain, uh, mm -hmm. who are of course no longer with us. Have they? Uh, is this going to be the first time that they bring the artist that they're talking about in to play with the orchestra? Um, yes, for these pieces, yes, I believe so. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so have you, have you gotten to hear or from anyone in the orchestra about this piece yet? Um, I have worked with the organist a little bit since, um, the piece includes organ. It's such an important part of, you know, the band's music that we decided to use the, use the, the organ in the hall. So, um, <laughs> you know, from what I hear, they're, they're psyched about it. They're genuinely, you know looking forward to it so so you're going from like the 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 electric organ that that yes would have used to the the big concert hall organ yeah that's gonna, very exciting yeah <laughs> um it's it's <laughs> sort of strange to me uh I, I it's not surprising i think maybe that uh the orchestra musicians are loving it because let's assume that you gave us perfectly translated 
yes for orchestra. Yeah. There's no reason. I mean, that sounds like something a classical musician would, musician would like. When you listen to it, it's very orchestral. You know, it's it's big. It uses heavy orchestration that will, that will then shrink down to nothing like Mahler, you know. It's easy to see how a classical musician would like this stuff. I know um, composers who have spent their careers trying to write that. Exactly. <laughs> there, there are probably pretty successful band composers that write stuff that sounds a lot like it and make a living doing it. So. Yeah. It's it's interesting that it's like it's not like you're asking them to like something that's foreign to them, even though they may not realize it so much. I don't know how big of a yes fan the average orchestra performer is. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. There's a lot of uh, pretty serious musicians and music people who are into yes, so yeah, it might be surprising how many. <laughs> yeah, I think yes is kind of one of those common things that um, conservatory musicians pick out as you know this is this is my rock band because they <laughs> they do weird crazy things and it's very <laughs> intricate just like just like this other music that i like and they've also got like this the 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 intense level of like uh you know uh what's virtuosity you know they oh, yeah. really play the crap out of their instruments which is something your classically trained musician likes yeah, and yeah. I was gonna say like Rick Wakeman on keyboards, he he included church organ a couple times in different albums and stuff. So and in like, yeah, his his classical chops and everything are, are right up there. Yeah, they're all really great, really great yeah. musicians. So. Did you get to work with anybody, any of the other guys? Uh no, no, I've met them, but um, I've just worked with Alan. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I'm curious, Alex, what's your, do you have any pop music or rock band experience uh, as, when you were growing up? Um, I played in, I played in a couple of bands in college and grad school um, as a keyboardist and, and also a percussionist. Cool. But uh, yeah, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a super serious affair. You know, I liked doing it, but you know. These, were you, go ahead, Sam. You familiar with Yes's music at all before you were contacted? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the way I know them best is from, um, you know, when I was in high school in like the mid in the mid '80s. So the 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 nine oh one two five album, you know, with yeah. owner owner of a lonely heart. That's a song, you know, that one of yeah. those. A version of uh, Leave It was on that album, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that was the music that I knew immediately, just because I grew up with it. There, you know, those songs that you know through osmosis. Like, there's not necessarily any reason you would know all the words, and yet you do. You know, <laughs> so, so, um, you know, there was I knew their that music, but you know, with this project, I learned I listened to so much other stuff, and I, I didn't really know about their work in the '70s, like the Closer to the Edge album and. Tales from Topographic Ocean. So it was really cool to delve into that stuff as a as a you know as an adult and and realize, gosh, this is really good and intense music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why did I not know about this before? So that's cool. Uh, it, it seems like this is kind of a trend among not just orchestras but classical music in general um, is finding ways to to bridge this gap between what what we grew up doing and what we grew up listening to um or hearing on the radio and it's a really interesting project that that they have and it's it's particularly interesting in seattle uh for them to want to connect with all these great seattle seattle rock musicians um because of course seattle has such a, an amazing rock tradition that they grew out of their um so it's, it's very cool and we see this in a lot of places and it seems like I, I can't think of any other projects like this where they're working with composers to create new things that are unique, that are that are neither fully uh, in the classical tradition and and not and also not just taking this popular music and kind of transcribing it for orchestra. There's so, there's so much bad music that comes out of that Seriously, and, and this, it's yeah. it's it's really tricky i remember i read a blog post i think the st louis symphony orchestra blog uh eddie silva ha had linked to somebody that that had written uh the intersection of classical and popular music is almost always con queso um so <laughs> <laughs> i think that's 
probably as accurate uh, as, as a description as I could have ever made. Um, so it's really cool that you're, that you're doing this. I don't know if you've, have you had any experience working with any of these other kinds of projects, Alex? No, no, this is the first time for this. Um, and I do think it's a really, it's a really cool, um, project and it, it really makes sense. Um, it's a really good way for, you know, for, for an orchestra to, to build an audience and have a connection with their community and with, you know, stuff that's going on in their city that, that people there care about, you know, so. Being something besides a museum and, and doing yeah. that in a way that's not just having that one new piece on a concert of a bunch of 100 or 150-year-old pieces. Exactly. I mean, this this concert also features, I mean, um, some other really great composers. Arlene Sierra is going to be on it. She is she is tackling Alice in Chains. Yeah. Um, wow. And her husband, Ken Hesketh, is doing a group that I don't know, but um, they are a Seattle group called the Blue Scholars. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So, so it's, you know, also three world premier premieres of new pieces and two by women, which is cool. That's very and, exciting. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it's a good thing. They're doing yeah. good stuff. They have lots of other cool projects, too. I mean, Seattle is an orchestra that seems to be pretty healthy in an environment when a lot aren't so yeah and they've been doing they've been doing a lot of new music and a lot of commissions um yeah. and this is this is just what the second second year for their new music director the yeah. drawer schwartz just retired two years ago or i guess a year and a half ago now um so it's very cool and he and he did a lot of that stuff too toward the, especially toward the end of his tenure there and so it's really cool to see them continuing these projects uh with with in some slightly new directions with a new music director so that's very yeah. cool is yeah. there someone who is sort of like overseeing the sonic evolution uh program uh apart from the music director or is that i don't know what i'm saying um there there is another there are other people who sort of help him you okay. know we should get do him. that. So as a group, they're 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 making it happen. <laughs> we should get him on the show, Dave. We'll, we'll add him to the <laughs> list. The list. The list that just keeps getting longer. Um, should we get into our stories? Yes. All and right. Go. So we have the orchestra block this week. We 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 took a long time. We got so tired of talking about orchestras for a really long time, and then things continued to get uh, increasingly more. Uh, Noteworthy, I suppose. I was going to say interesting, but I'm not sure that's the word either. Um, they've continued to get, to get more noteworthy, and we couldn't ignore it anymore. And now we've talked about orchestras every week for the last month and a half. Um, but, but there is a little bit of of good news and bad news this week. Uh, the Minnesota Orchestra is officially locked out. They join the ranks of. Uh, several other orchestras that did not start their seasons on schedule this year. Um, it's a, it's a growing problem. And I think one of the, one of the really strange things or perhaps noteworthy things this season is how many of the orchestras that are locked out or on strike are big time orchestras like the Minnesota orchestra. Last week we talked about the Chicago symphony orchestra last season. We were talking about the Philadelphia orchestra. So this is, this I think used to be a thing that was confined to regional and smaller to medium budget orchestras. And we're now seeing it happen with larger and larger budget orchestras. Um, so that's a little bit scary. Do you guys have any thoughts on the situation in Minnesota? If you don't, that's cool. <laughs> Um, I think we, we talked about this last week or maybe two weeks ago, uh, about why we sometimes don't talk about these things. Cause it seems often that the orchestra is more and more removed from the new music community. Um, and I think it was Tristan Parrish that pointed out that these people are part of our community. Um, even when the orchestras as organizations are not necessarily playing, uh, a, a lot of new music. They are still playing some. Minnesota, of course, uh, is is particularly renowned for their new music initiatives. Um, but these are people that are a part of our community. Um, so 
I, th- I think it's it's worth keeping apprised of some of these things. The San Antonio Symphony is back to work this week. Um, so congratulations to them for getting a deal done. That's very exciting. And San Antonio is back to uh, listening to their music. Um, the Jacksonville Orchestra, just up the road a piece from me, uh, really got got slammed in the local press this week. The Jacksonville Orchestra is 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 not uh, not starting their season on schedule either. Um, but an editorial in the Florida Times Union uh, says, despite splendid programs by 53 talented musicians in one of the finest concert halls around, there likely will be an appalling number of empty seats in Jacoby Hall. So there, and and it is blamed on um, just really bad management, and that's something that uh, we read a lot about in all of these labor disputes, um, but. We're mostly reading that from the musicians, and that's what you say when you're in a labor dispute. Labor says, "Administration, administration, <laughs> bah! You did a crappy job. If you did a better job, you'd have more money, and you could pay us what we're worth." And the administration says, "Bah! You're asking for way too much. That's completely unreasonable." Yes, but with an orchestra, who else's fault is it going to be? You know. Okay. Well, I mean, does it have to <laughs> be the fault musicians. of one of those two sides? I think people are just going to less concerts, fewer concerts. But- um. <laughs> going to lesser concerts. <laughs> they could be going to lesser concerts too. <laughs> Instead, no. no. <laughs> so, I, mean, I had gotten to unmute my mic, Dave. But what I was going to tell you is the you asked if we had any comments about the Minnesota. Oh, the music they bet use in the background of their little campaign video was a very poor choice. That was my comment. Oh yeah, they do. I I, <laughs> I forgot to mention that summer. the musicians themselves of the Minnesota Orchestra made. Uh, uh, a video of like them standing in places around the Twin Cities holding signs. It's it looks a little overwrought um, for me. And I don't. What's the music that they're playing, Sam? I don't remember. I don't know. Something romantic and orchestral, and made it sound like they were going to start talking about you know glass slippers and getting home before midnight and stuff like that. Oh, really? I got the impression that they were going to, it was going to, like any minute, Alyssa Milano was going to show you two quarters and say, for 50 cents a day, you... <laughs> no, it was too, way too saccharine this sounding for that. Yeah. It was saccharine sounding for that, even. So, anyway. anyway um, that's, that's the orchestra news block. It's Thank done. You. We're not talking about it anymore. So, for those of you that... Turn your volume down on your on your transistor radios for that segment. You can you can turn them back up. Um, <laughs> big music news in the MacArthur Genius Award this year. Big mm. music news. Big music news of two completely different types. Um, well, go for it. It's not. It's the what is it? The MacArthur Fellowship. Uh, they don't call it the Genius yeah. Award, but everybody else does. So <laughs> everybody knows it's the Genius Award. Um, Ice founder uh, Claire Chase. Flutist. And, uh, flautist, flutist, and Flute Chris Thiele. Is that correct? Uh, Chris Thiele. Yeah. Chris Thiele. Thiele, uh, who uh, formerly of Nickel Creek Punch, Punch Brothers Creek with his family, well, still of Punch Brothers. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and Punch yeah. Brothers and Punch Brothers have d- did the most awesome cover of Kid A ever. You can find <laughs> it on YouTube. There was another. There was another musician that got put into this group by all of the stories that I read and it's a bow maker and I oh. don't remember who that is but I didn't think it was that interesting so I didn't write it down um, but if you think that's interesting you should follow the links to the stories that we're going to link to and read about the bow maker as well I well, think as the a... bow maker is cool yeah well yeah. clearly I'm just a jerk well <laughs> you're you... not a string instrument player that's true wow. <laughs> Nate explain to us why the bow maker is cool I mean, it's it's a delicate art, and it's it's. I mean, how else could it not be cool for how expensive good bows are? You know. <laughs> and that's that is, I think, how we measure how cool something is right. in the United States of America. They get paid well, if not often, then. But you know, you could use that if that argument made sense. Then you could use it to prove that Michael Bay is a great film director. A brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> where is where is Michael Bay's MacArthur Genius Award? That's what I want to know. Uh, um, Dave, the way the reason I thought it was cool is because I would also think it were cool if they had a master saxophone technician. Yeah, like like maybe Sam Mercier's. Like me. Just saying. 
No, I mean, I pre- I listened to the story and, and I appreciated it for, on the same level, except I think that stuff gets overhyped. I don't think there's any bow or any violin that's worth the money that people pay for them because there's just no way to engineer something that's so much better that it's worth that much more money. It's all just snake oil salesmanship that makes things cost that much. Well, I think any, I think any violinist would tell you that you, you have 10 ears if you say that. Well, and I've said this before. That is my engineering understanding of the situation and sort of the pure logic way of talking about it. However, pure logic doesn't work with players, and that's the thing you learn working at the shop. If <laughs> it, it does make a difference because they think it does, and because they think it does, it does. Because Unquote Sam Mercier's. He just said, performers are illogical people. Don't trust them. Unquote <laughs> Sam Mercier's. If they believe, if they believe it's going to have a difference, then it does have a difference. Therefore, it does have a difference, even if it, you can't mechanically prove how it happens. Well, I'd like to see that study that did research into what exactly makes a good bow a good bow. Mm-hmm. And like the, the really, really small physical details that make a like that make a bow able to do a good maybe you have to do that like study that. i yeah, i don't i don't think i've got the gear for it but you know maybe you can get a <laughs> maybe you can get a grant for it yeah, yeah there we go <laughs> although with this grant you just have to uh like there's no way to apply for it you just have to be right. doing what you do well yeah. for a long time and be known for it and then they say that's awesome you're going to get $500,000 over the next 5 years Yes, and that's 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 I think one of the, one of everyone's favorite things about this particular award is is, is it somebody saying is, is you're not asking for it. Somebody just recognizes that the things that you are doing are worthwhile and valuable to society, and you should be able to spend your time focusing on those things and making the creating the most value for our culture and our society um so congratulations to claire chase and chris thiele and all the other um macarthur award winners and thank you to the macarthur foundation for giving those out very cool project yeah, uh, and we, kind of, we don't I sh- we shouldn't gloss over how profound it could be for us right here that uh claire chase is going to get all that cash (laughs) you know she's already she's already done this one thing that's awesome so what's she going to do now you know so yeah i mean that's that's the thing you know watch watch this space as they say watch watch these people and see what what cool things that they can do with uh with this money um there are as as some of the articles point out there's no obligation to these uh, award winners to to use the money for anything in particular, but we assume that they have selected wisely to find people that are going to use the money to do awesome things. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely be watching to see what cool new things happen at ICE and other, other cool places. Uh, another interesting project, the Rest is Noise Festival. Um, so... I'm sure that most, if not all, of our audience is familiar with Alex Ross's brilliant book, uh, "The Rest Is Noise: Listening to Music in the 21st Century or the 20th Century," um, and it's it's just a fantastic account of um, some music that is not always thought of as the most listener friendly, but uh, he presents it in such a compelling way and makes such a great case for this very challenging music. Um, that it, it often, <clears throat> I think it has the potential to bring in a lot of new people. This, this festival is going to take place at London South Bank Center in January. So this coming January, 2013. Um, and it, so it was just announced, uh, earlier this year. Um, and it's going to be based around a lot of the music that, Alex Ross talks about in that book and th- there's uh, some publicity is starting to go up around London for this and there's a, an article in the Independent um, I'm not sure it's a particularly newsworthy article but it says it's titled does anyone like modern classical music and I think the assumption is uh, no and it says there, there is there is to be a year long festival of contemporary music at London South Bank Center. But will the public reason. go? 
Yeah. First of all, I object to his conflation of modern and contemporary, uh, and you know the the rest is noise ends in like the eighties, maybe. How far does it? It doesn't. It doesn't get into the the last twenty years very much. Um, so I don't know it what he's talking about with the contemporary thing, but um, gets a little bit past the modern period music, though. You know. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Well, I, I think considering the author's editorial voice, though, that's a perfect picture to start the article with. What's the picture? Stockhausen, like, with a giant score open, hunched over, staring at the stage with mixers and cables in the front. That's, uh, you know, you can, uh, American audiences will go, ooh, look at that. I can tell I'm not going to like that. Just look at that guy. <laughs> look at this stuff. So, curious. The, the thing that bugs me the most about this, first of all, there's, there's precious little time devoted to contemporary or modern or whatever we're calling it, recent classical music in the popular press. And still, a lot of it is this. A lot of it is this kind of thing. Like, what is this crap? And uh, that was, I don't know who, who what voice that was, but that uh, society has somehow made its peace with or agreed to disagree with Jackson Pollock and is made its peace with or agreed to disagree with um, Marcel Duchamp. But for some reason, Stockhausen is still offensive enough to someone's sensibilities that they need to write uh, a long article about it. And I think it is the thing that bugs me the most about this particular article is that it is about the rest is noise festival because this is the whole point of <laughs> Ross's book is that this thing is not as scary as you have been led to believe that this thing is right. This is not some wild, crazy like mishmash of sounds. Somebody was very thoughtful in putting this together and here is why it's thoughtful and here is what you might enjoy hearing from this thing. It blows my mind that somebody could read The Rest is Noise and still write this article or even just know what The Rest is Noise is and write this article. Um, so I'm pointing to my monitor. If you're watching the video and like, what is he pointing at? I'm pointing to my monitor, which has the article up on it right now. Um, so I, I don't know. Th this, the, to me, that's the most disappointing thing about this article is that the people who read this and agree with him are exactly the people who should check this concert series out. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing the author maybe didn't read the book or, you know, just tossed out Veyburn. You're going to get smacked over the head with Veyburn. It's going to be horrible. You know, oh. so, uh, yeah. I mean, even if you don't like Veyburn, it's going to be over pretty soon anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, right? To me, the what's disappointing, and I knew this was going to happen. I was waiting for Dave to go off on his rant about this. I don't rant. Um, <laughs> it should be noted that I knew Dave was going to do that because just because of the way he notated the article in our Google Doc. <laughs> I could, I could hear, I could see the vitriol in his prose, yeah. um, his tone. Yes, yeah. the way it's sort of uh, the article operates, sort of assuming that everybody who's in the know, who knows, knows that all that music is ugly and alienating, and you're never going to penetrate it, and we're just going to laugh at it, you know. So it's kind of like let's laugh at that music like we know we always do, you know. It's sort of the uh, you know he everybody's in on it with this guy so, or, or girl. Yeah, yeah, Alexandra. Yeah. Everybody's in on it with her, you know. Um, that's sort of the tone it seems to strike to me, mm -hmm. which is disappointing. Well, <laughs> I think we've got that one nailed. That was a downer, man. Oh, man. Well, let's talk about another downer. Um, another thing that might prevent people from visiting the concert hall is that they feel obligated to dress a certain way when they go there. And the English National Opera is coming to the rescue. They are starting a new project uh, called Opera Undressed. And I, if you're thinking that you should go to the opera naked, you should reconsider. Uh, <laughs> what they're saying is you shouldn't feel obligated to dress fancy 
in any way. You should dress in jeans and a t-shirt if that's what suits you to go to the opera. And they are selling uh, some relatively low price seats for uh, rel- relatively good seats for relatively low prices. Uh, and you wear whatever you like and you can uh, download the synopsis of the opera beforehand, which is I don't know why that's a special thing. That should be standard for all opera, but whatever. What do you guys think of not holding people or, or I guess I, I, there's no one saying that they were holding people. There's not a dress code before and now there's no dress code. They're just being very explicit that there is no dress code. What do you think? <laughs> there will be no frowns if you wear <laughs> a hoodie to this orchestra concert. So I, <laughs> here's the thing. I don't think that's actually the case. I think right. if you do wear a hoodie, <laughs> there will be people who give you a look and say, what are you doing at the opera in a hoodie, you hoodlum? Uh, <laughs> but the uh, the company, the, the, the organization is saying that's okay, but they didn't like clear it with Uncle Fester who's had subscription for the last 45 years i mean i don't know i've i've seen people dressed uh like younger people coming to uh orchestra concerts here in michigan that were were not i in think school orchestra or, concerts are different than than pro jocks you don't think or what i think when you go to a university orchestra concert there are expectations that you've got a oh, bunch I, of university well, students I mean, who just like came from in, class but I mean, in like Detroit or Grand Rapids. Oh, okay. Or, yeah, and uh, I mean, maybe it's just the way things roll in Michigan, where everybody's like groovy and relaxed at their orchestra concerts. <laughs> you know, this this argument about wearing whatever has been going on for so 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 long. Yeah. It's so tiresome. I cannot even believe that that we're still like talking. <laughs> Talking about it, it, I mean, I remember clearly it was a thing when I was in grad school, you know, 15 years ago. Let's wear black jeans, the, or the performers. Well, you know, we won't dress up, and it'll be more relaxed, and the audience can wear whatever. The, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And I'm sure that it was going on long before that, even. Yeah. Like, why is this still a thing? I mean, if you go, I mean, I live in Baltimore. When you go to the Baltimore Symphony, there is a range of people. There are people in suits and formal-ish dresses. There are people in jeans and T-shirts. People don't care. And the same, you know, in Seattle, there's a range of dress. It's casual or and from, from casual to dressed up. I mean, I'm from Washington, D.C., so the National Symphony, you know, D.C. is a different place. It's a little bit more formal, but still, there's a range. Like, get over it. That's not going to, it's not going to help anything. There's also people who like the ritual of dressing up to go to a concert. So, you know, this is a, this is a very surface level, like, way to deal with these issues. Yeah, I think I think the idea that there is this like w- large segment of the population that would just be beating down the door of their local symphony hall or opera hall if only it weren't for this perceived dress code is a little ridiculous. Yeah. This is not the thing that is keeping people from subscribing to the opera. Now right? that my shoes and belt don't have to match, I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, it's not the dress that it, it's not the dress that's going to make people more comfortable. It's like it's building trust with the audience that does show up, regardless of what they are wearing. Right. To, you know. However, if they if they get more butts in the seats by doing this and, and it works, more power to them. Sure. And I think to me the biggest thing in this, but is the part that is not the thing for which it is named and therefore gets less attention, is the cheap good seats. So they're selling yeah, right. good seats in the hall for 25 pounds. That's fabulous. That's yeah. fantastic. To me, when I don't go to a, an opera or a symphony concert, that's the thing that's preventing me from going is the, right. the 50 70 $80 ticket. You know, it's, it's not the dress code. I'll wear whatever I want. And if somebody gives me a dirty look, I'll give them a dirty look right back. How do you like them <laughs> apples, Uncle Fester? <laughs> so... But there are pe- there are these people though, right? There are there are people in the hall that will give people a stern talking to if they don't behave in the hall the way that they think they should behave. Right. Um, 
And I think that's a problem, but I don't think there's anything that orchestras can do about it because those people buy subscriptions and donate money and whatever else people that have money do, right? Dressage. Dressage, right. Those are the people that do dressage, and the people that do dressage get to come to the concert and do whatever they want. I'm kind of glad. I don't even know what that means. It's fine. Horse dancing. Horse dancing. Where have oh, you been? Oh, okay. Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, you mean that, that new Korean music video? That... <laughs> <laughs> this thing? Yeah, right? Yes, G- Gangnam Style. That's dressage. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so, Sam, why don't you take this last story? There's another, another story of the intersections of classical music and not classical music. Yes. Um, it's no uh, surprise to pe- people that have watched the show that I'm not a huge Philip Glass fan. What? Uh, I know, I know. Um, however, I have discovered a way that I actually find his music enjoyable. Um, when it's there, remixed? Yes. Project, when it is no longer his music? That's right. There's a project. Um, Philip Glass, according to the article, actually approached Beck, as in the pop star, two turntables and a microphone, Beck, um, about uh, who might be interested in doing some remix of his own work, of Glass's work. And uh, I, I hide it to him. He seems very open to the idea of having his music be material uh, for someone else to, to work with. And we know that there are composers out there who that would be very much against their composer religion, you know? Yeah, um, I got to say, I was actually, um, I was pleasantly surprised by that because, mm-hmm. you know, he has his own ensemble. He has the, the Phil Glass ensemble. And one would assume that somebody who sees fit to have to put together their own ensemble because they're the only people that are going to play the music right would be against other people doing things with their music, right? What's more, uh, uh, you know, lots of composers make the argument that they don't want their music used by someone else for possible gain and all that. This is a composer who actually has an argument to make because his music does make him lots of money and has for a long time, you know. So he, that argument actually holds water for this composer. Um, and he was very open to that, it seems. And uh, the album is already available. It's uh, reworked Philip Glass Remixed. Um, and it's got a bunch of different people on there. Uh, Cornelius, I'm familiar with. But you can read out about it. It's available on Amazon. And uh, you can listen to, there's a story, we'll have a link uh, on NPR, um, where they talk about the the project and you can listen to one of Beck, the the remix by Beck. And uh, I listened to that this morning and it was really cool. Awesome. <laughs> like it had a compelling nature that most of the time Philip Glass's music never has to me. <laughs> so would you, would you guys let your music be remixed? Oh God. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Alex, would you, would you let some, sure, why not? I, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I wouldn't have a problem with that. There's one thing in this article that's interesting to me, like uh, Philip Glass telling a story about this cellist that he worked with, and the cellist was oh Arthur Russell, piece and, yeah, or what? The Arthur Russell, yeah, story, and that, yeah. that's such a cool, cool story about the, the Arthur Russell making this piece so much his own that Philip Glass was like, "Wow, this is this is yours, awesome." It, have any of you ever had that experience with, like? Working with a yes. performer, yeah. Um, Eric Lau, who is the sax professor at the University of New Mexico, um, I had played him some music that I did when I was in a sort of a live electronica sort of jam band where I use effects pedals on the floor. And uh, he said, hey, you should write me a piece that uses that stuff. So I did. And uh, I wrote the piece, you know, trying to work with what I thought I could get him to accomplish versus what I knew those little pieces of equipment would accomplish, you know, and, and then try and figure out a way to describe that and then worked with him to figure out. So it was like teaching him how sort of electronic or teaching him sort of how signal processing works, you know, and, and getting an idea for what was and wasn't possible. And uh, it's really like it's been performed by other people, but uh, in a way that's completely informed by the way he and I figured out how to make it work the first time. You know yeah, what I mean? Cool. That's very cool. It was rough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my phone with me describing how to hook stuff up. Sa- and- Sam Rasiers is your live electronic music tech support line. There you go. It's 
help me plug this thing into this other thing. You should write that in the score. Put a stomp box. That would be what you'd want to have with two X's. No, no, no. Stomp box. That would work. No, I, I don't think <laughs> it would. I think you're... Well, we need to work on Sam's spelling. Stomp box. Uh, <laughs> I think it's time, by the way, speaking of live electronics. For the pick of the <laughs> <laughs> I so every time we do that I think we should just record that and I should just hit a button here and play it but it's too much fun to watch Sam go and then do it right away <laughs> um. I do like the live element <laughs> yeah <laughs> what do you got Sam Sam sorry I, I didn't I rigged up my reflector today oh wow the, the five months of overcast has begun in Michigan, so I have to use artificial light with a reflector instead of opening the window. Yeah, I just yeah. I just opened the window here because I live in Florida and there's sun here. Well, you know, yeah. I was just like a pianist just <laughs> on stage who forgot a page turn or something, like, I'm going to do it. I'm like, oh, no, this reflector is in the way. <laughs> so, that was blue. Well, that would have been compelling non-television. Um so our pick of the week this week is, uh, of course, as, as usual, a work by our guest, Alex Gardner. This piece is called Luminoso, uh, and it is for guitar. It seems that we've created an inadvertent theme today of collaborating across genres. So, uh, Alex, you want to maybe uh, tell us a little bit about Luminoso? Luminoso, classical guitar, electronics. I wrote it in Spain going to make Nate's video or that I wrote it in while I was living in Spain for a guitarist there named Enrique Lop and it is this is a recording from um it's part of a series it's a part of a series for solo instrument with electronics that I've been developing over the years and it's on a recording that's called Luminoso that's on a Nova Discs all right so let's take take a quick listen and see if this doesn't blow up the internet That was an excerpt from Luminoso by our guest, uh, Alex Gardner. Alex, thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Thank you for playing me. It's a, a very, very cool piece um, that includes a lot of, uh, of the language of Spanish flamenco guitar. Um, and I was I'm, I'm reminded of some of the things that we talked about earlier when you're talking about working with Alan White of Yes, uh, of kind of taking the language of this other world yet creating something new with it uh and I, i'm wondering how how closely you're working with uh you were working with enrique lop when you were writing this piece um he kind of came in towards the end and and we i already had some of the spanish stuff the rasqueado and some of the techniques in there, but uh, he helped. That's the to strumming, sort of, right? Yeah, the strumming. Okay. So, um, yeah, he just kind of swept in and made it happen, really. Okay. So that's really interesting because I usually think of guitar as one of those instruments that is it's so very particular in its idiosyncrasies that you have to I almost work with uh, a guitarist. I'm not sure I could right now pick up a some staff paper and, and write something out for guitar. So yeah, is that, guitar do you have a lot of guitar experience? Um, I have a little bit, but I did, you know, study a lot of guitar music and I, and I consulted some, um, 
guitarist while I was working on it and as well as him. So, so I had, I had people to test stuff out on. Right. Okay. So that's, that's good to know. Uh, like the kitchen sink in, in chat, Phil Sink asked, can you mention how, it's on, how scary it is to write for classical guitar? Um, <laughs> so I, you, you had that experience and you got that out of the, out of your system before you got to that step with working with Enrique Lop. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, it is. It's writing for classical guitar is hard. So, or for guitar at all. Yeah. Right. I would suggest uh, people interested check out uh, Alex's website because there's a video of of it being performed and it's uh, uh, it's really cool. You know, it looks it's it's fun to watch a guitar guitarist do that. You know, and uh, like there's some sweeping technique that happens in there that I didn't realize. So it looks very idiomatic to me. Um, so congratulations on writing for the guitar. <laughs> also, Thanks. I listened to it carefully this morning. Um, and I really thought it was engaging, and I couldn't quite f- understand why. And uh, like it wasn't, I didn't know what it was about it, but I think I got it after listening just then. It's that the guitar part has sort of a, a fantasia quality where it's, you know, stopping and starting and being expressive and slowing down, but there's a through goingness that's created by the electronic part. So it feels like this long, smooth thing that you're listening to, even though the guitar is very pointed at times. And, and that's what it is that I like about it. <laughs> and it's not too long. <laughs> and it's not too long. That's that's <laughs> Sam's big thing. If you write a piece that's less than twelve minutes, Sam will like it. Because <laughs> then he's got time to go play disc golf too. <laughs> good to know. Good to know. <laughs> no, I, I and I think that's another interesting thing, Sam, uh, is that it has this very traditional folk quality of of the flamenco guitar combined with the very not folk quality of the electronics is. is is where where is the uh the where are the sounds from in the in the electronics? The sounds are uh, completely synthesized. Recorded. They're no, they're oh, no. guitar. No, they're oh, guitar. Okay. They're actual recordings of of guitar. Yeah. yeah. Cool. That have been mangled. Yeah, there's a part in that you. I suspected it when I listened to it, but then when I watched the video, uh, like this, just downward scale, ding 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 ding. The thing we just ended yeah. with, yeah. The, the recording actually kind of takes over that mm-hmm. and then the guitar player moves on with something else. So that to me is a big difference between seeing it live because I think, you know, a person experiencing that performance live can't not be struck by that happening. If you're watching the guitar player's hands at all and seeing something that like that where, you know, fooled you sort of, you know, <laughs> that's got to have an effect on how you sort of cognate the piece after that point, which to me is a very interesting thing. It's cool. Yeah, I, I read on your website about having all the sounds come from the guitar. And what what was that process like working just from, I mean, there's only so many different kinds of sounds that you can make with a guitar, but you've got this whole other, like almost synthesizer layer kind of thing going in the, um, in the electronics track. What was it like getting from the guitar to the synthesizers <laughs> um well the way the way i do it is just in is using um you know pro tools and a bunch mm-hmm. of plugins and just recording recording a lot of different samples of guitar and and improvising with those cool um with processing them and then kind of going back and picking out the parts that i feel like work and will fit in with the piece were the guitar samples like sort of like normal finger quotes Guitar. Yeah, they were. So it wasn't like scraping it with a bow or anything like that. It was just no. Yeah. There was nothing super crazy. Yeah, there was some. There was you know the tapping thing, but but uh, and then just a lot of playing and and the percussive thing is is pretty familiar to flamenco too, right? The, yeah. Okay. So yeah. that's very cool. I, I like that that all of those sounds come from. And did you record all of those with Enrique? No, I didn't. He he uh, wasn't available at the very beginning part of this piece so i recorded them um some of it was just me playing and and then i recorded some other guitarists very cool just yeah i just write out like little little tiny phrases and stuff and ask them to to play those and just make a a big palette of like small things that i can work with 
Well, uh, I would encourage our audience to check out the the whole piece. You can you can stream the whole thing from Alex's website, and as Sam said, watch the video because the video is very cool, um, and it's also available from Innova. It's uh, on on Innova label, so check yeah. that out. Um, let's wrap this up for today, Alex. Thank you again for joining us. Where can people find you, and where can they hear your music in the near future? Um, you can find me online on my website at alexandragardner.net, and you can also find me on New Music Box, um, writing regularly. Um, and so as far as other concerts, there's the Seattle Symphony, October 26th. There are other things um, coming up in Boston, and uh, I always have updates first for about concerts and stuff on my website and Facebook. Great. Are, are there any other new like uh, composition projects we can look forward to he hearing eventually? Or? Um, yeah, I'm working on a on another one of these solo instrument um, with electronics pieces right now, percussion or percussion and, and electronics, and that's going to be done real soon and happening starting in November Great. in Boston um, and beyond. I'm not sure where yet. <laughs> and then uh, the next project is a wind ensemble piece. So saxophones for Sam. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if they break down, you know where to go. That's right. <laughs> uh, so that is going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. We want to thank everyone who joined us live. We do this show live every Sunday morning around 11 a.m. Eastern time. And you can join us. Uh, at soundnotion.tv slash live watch the thing as it's happening see all of our technical difficulties and you get to you get to see our i think hilarious technical difficulties i'm card. sorry i'm sorry it's all nate's fault <laughs> yeah. but if you're listening to this recording you won't know what i'm talking about because it will have been perfectly edited by me <laughs> um so uh we thank you for watching this live or watching it after the fact. If you want to comment on the show or reading about any of this, read further on any of the stories that we talked about. Um, you can find those links at soundnotion.tv slash SN. You can also connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, and you can leave a note. We're, we're at SoundNotion on Twitter. If you'd like to support the show, we have links on the right-hand side of our site, soundnotion.tv, where you can donate. Or better yet, this one is totally free to you. And I just mentioned this last week for the first time. There's an Amazon search box there. So the next time you just buying whatever on Amazon, you're buying Christmas gifts, whatever on Amazon. Uh, if you use that search box on our site to get there, we'll get a tiny little commission. It doesn't cost you anything extra. I mentioned this for the first time last week and we got like seven bucks this week, which is, mm -hmm. you know, seven bucks more than we would have gotten normally. Uh, and, and if, and if we do that just a little bit every week, then, uh, we will not lose money on this endeavor. So, uh, if you do that, we would really, we would really appreciate it. Um, this show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store, so be sure to go there and subscribe for free and catch every episode. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you back next week. Help. Help. <laughs> Help. <laughs>